It certainly isn't easy to live in a post-conflict state. These are nations already torn by conflict, rife with sectarian divides and at low levels of development because of mass destruction during the conflict. Thus, many citizens are deprived of the most basic needs and continue to live under the fear of conflict or revival of the conflict. Revol resolving this will be the priority of team proposition. Crimes that take place in post-conflict societies during the conflict exist along a spectrum, from the foot soldier ordered to commit a crime, like att attacking civilians, to the general who gave them that order. The process of prosecution, therefore, must prove beyond reasonable doubt that one is a criminal to get punishment. This is often a long, drawn process that for complex cases, like of conflict, can last for over a decade during which there can be countless trials where evidence is excoviated and victims and witnesses are cross-examined over and over again on the stand. News media will also cover the trial in great detail, dividing the post-conflict society amongst different sides of the trial. Prosecution is done by the victor of the conflict, who hires the prosecutors that press charges, controls legal institutions, and forms the government after the post-conflict that will be responsible for this prosecution. Opposition, therefore, cannot stand for international tribunals or the International Criminal Court alone because international courts often prosecute, decide, uh, or only select individuals and prosecutors may decide not to prosecute who the, the society deems uh, fit for prosecution and usually goes after only single major perpetrators like military generals, for example. Hence, on opposition, the bulk of the prosecutorial work will have to be done by the post-fought conflict society itself. Our, po our policy, therefore, is that we will grant amnesty to perpetrators of crimes rather than seek prosecution. In, in place of prosecution, we rather truth and reconciliation com committees. These committees often allow victims on all sides of the conflict to come forth and tell their stories, while perpetrators are also then incentivized to come forward to confess and apologize to their crimes. Crucially, the difference is that prosecution is focused on proving that one is a criminal and punishing individuals and dividing the society along lines of right or wrong. While truth and reconciliation committees sir, focus on moving the nation or standing forward by respecting all perspectives of the conflict. We acknowledge the importance of justice, but recognize that in this debate, justice is only a means to an end for protecting Why citizens, is, not an end in and of itself. No, thank you. So we much rather go by the metric that we protect our citizens, current and in the future, as a priority of this debate. My first argument will be on how we end the loss of lives faster during the conflict, and my second argument will be on how we aid post-conflict reconciliation, post-conflict in society. Order, my second speaker will argue that it is uniquely proposition that betters the sustainability of peace in the long run. But before I move on to my first argument, yes sir, give me one real-life example of mass amnesty for these prosecutors, uh, these mass, a uh, mass amnesty has actually solved for justice. Thank you. In my arguments later, I'll be giving you plenty of illustrations in actual real-life uh, examples of countries where the amnesty has made the country more unified and even put for even more social, political, and economical unity. Moving back to my first argument on how we end the loss of lives faster, and the thesis of this argument is that granting amnesty incentivizes antagonists in the conflict and warring factions to cease fire more readily on side opposition. Premise: When people fight in a conflict their self-preservation instincts kick in. The looming fear of being prosecuted pushes people to fight as brutally, as unscrupulously as possible on site opposition to avoid the process of prosecution for two systemic reasons. The first is because often one crime is enough to get you a very severe sentence which people fear. When one bullet you fire, one shot you take is enough to kill one person, that is when the prosecution is able to make you go to prison for life. But the second systemic reason is because this is especially so when you lose because the victor will be the one in charge of the prosecution. When they choose to over-prosecute your side, your losing side, out of fear that there might be some oppositional elements left over in society. When the victor is incentivized to cast the net as wide as possible to make sure that as many of their people are caught. This translates into proponents of violence and warring factions being even more ruthless doing whatever it takes on side opposition to win that, in, win that conflict to avoid the scenario of prosecution. It prolongs conflicts and drags even more victims into collateral because people want to avoid prosecution at all costs, they do whatever it takes, they use even more unethical means. 
On side opposition, that's what happens with factions. What is the comparative on proposition? Information. With amnesty, no thank you, in place of prosecution, fighting factions are incentivized to give up and settle for resolutions for two reasons. The first is especially when you are losing in the conflict or you begin to think that you are losing the upper hand in the conflict and you might suddenly slide into disadvantage in the conflict. This is when you are incentivized to not draw out the conflict any longer, to not try to create even more damage in the, in the long run because you want to avoid, the, because you do know that amnesty is waiting for you after the conflict rather than prosecution. You know that you will not be heavily prosecuted on such proposition. But the second reason is because in majority of conflicts in these societies, it is often a war of attrition, guerrilla fighting, or even perhaps fighting on the streets where people are destroying infrastructure. And people obviously don't want to rule or waste land after the post-conflict. They want to make sure that the country is in some shape or form in order to be able to continue living in their society. So on our side, when we have the push of amnesty in place of prosecution, these individuals have more incentive to make sure that the country or the, or the society is kept at least in some form or shape functional and more likely to come to the table to negotiate. This is better for two structural reasons, no thank you. The first is because we stop fighting more when we end civil wars in society. We give you the example of how the civil war in Colombia responding to their first POI between the nation and the FARC rebels, for example. The closer people live to the conflict, the more likely they were to campaign that the rebels fighting against them should be granted amnesty because they just want the fighter to stop. No thank you. And at the point in which amnesty was given to the FARC rebels in Colombia, it is only then when the entire nation as a whole was able to move on and progress economically. The second reason is because you're more likely to negotiate and discuss with other factions. So on our side, we end conflicts faster. Second argument on aiding post-conflict reconciliation. And the thesis of this argument is that granting amnesty to perpetrators uniquely allows for reconstruction of functioning nations post-conflict. Before I begin this argument, note that the most important metric in today's debate is which side is best able to help the people post-conflict to rebuild the lives affected by the conflict that prevents future victims. Premise. During the conflict, there's immense antagonism amongst opposing parties because emotions must have been provoked for people to even lay down their lives in the first place. This is highly problematic when on opposition, the victor of the conflict will be the one prosecuting because they will be in charge of the trial process, they will bring this anger and emotions into the process of the trial. Prosecution solidifies and enshrines this antagonism between different, between different factions. On the spectrum of post-conflict societies, prosecution is worse off for the majority. On conflicts, where there's a huge group of people fighting against one power, say a dictator or an authoritarian regime, for example, imagine what will happen when the victor is the one who is the dictator to oppressive regime. We bring to you the example of Erdogan and how after the coup, he was able to use the prosecution to crack down massively on opposition, for example. And this is the majority of the conflicts that exist in status quo, because you recognize that smaller groups probably won't win against massive dictators and their militaries. So it's on opposition when dictators and oppressive regimes have this unique tool of prosecution in their arsenal to legitimize their rule by saying, according to law, these people are wrong. On our side, we believe that we cannot get a better future if we are stuck in the past we propose. Our team has two questions to address into this point of the debate. Firstly, on account of their mechanism of 
their truth and reconciliation committee, and secondly, which team better solve when it comes to the aspects of conflict resolution. So firstly, on their mechanism. We say that they have never proved why this is going to be so effective under their drastic characterization of how people will be so distrustful for law enforcement or so distrustful against each other. We say that when people, uh, according to their logic, under the reconciliation committee, come together and tell about conflicting narratives, this will be even more divisive because media attention will sensationalize conflicting narratives with each other, especially under a world where no formal reparations at a common sense level has not happened. So we never get the mechanism why this type of band-aid solution will actually grant long-term stability and conflict the resolution. So this nicely leads on to the next question about which team better serves when it comes what to the resolution of post-conflict societies. We see that the characterization that they give on their side is very counterintuitive. They say that since people have the instinct of self-preservation, they're going to kill everyone if they know that they're fearing prosecution. We see that this simply does not make sense because the reason why people Madam. fight in the first place is not because they want to avoid persecution. We see that people fight because they lack of resources or the cultural religious differences and the, the presence of prosecution there makes them to makes them to use softer methods, to, to use less violent methods of when it comes to them acquiring their goal as a function or as a cleavage. So we don't get why simply people are going to be more violent or people are going to be suddenly more ruthless when they know that there's going to be prosecution. They never prove the logical way behind that. So we say that under our world, we want to go for the restoration of justice and long-term stability. We say that they have never proven to us why, why granting amnesty will do this better in any way, because we see that under their logic and characterization of self-interested individuals, the, the, the insurance that you have amnesty will rather embolden them. Since they're self-interested, they're going to seize as much resources as they can within that conflict period, and then move on, and which will lead to festering conflict, people, people bring up different narratives of what should be actually done within this post-conflict society. We see that when it comes to law enforcement, when it comes to writing the constitution together, there needs to be legalistic procedures like war crimes or like very atrocious things that need to be needs to be done at the legal enforcement level. And it should be concluded first, but then before the country moving, moving along together. Yes, sir. On your side, because of the immense pressure of prosecution, that is when cultural religious groups advocate for the annihilation of an entire other culture of people so that they can become a top in the person. Because that's simply unrealistic, and I'm going to provide you a more genuine characterization of what will actually happen. So we see that the burden under the government team is to prove why they should unilaterally exonerate every individual regardless of the extent of atrocities that they have committed in both principle and practical level. And the mechanism that we stand for is the proportional prosecution of individuals, as they have explained, and we want this to be based on the standard of breaking international norms made contributing the Geneva Convention. We see that this mechanism must include reparation. What does this mean is that we need economic distribution when it comes to individuals that unjustly require and acquire their wealth and resources during that conflict period. We want those locals to redistribute their resources by the government when it comes to people no in real need. No, sir. So we see that courts and tribunals will take place, legal enforcement will take place under our country, and this would lead to the clear conclusion of conflict and the clear solution of what actually happened and the government clearly standing by a logical line. So on to your first argument about the principle of government responsibility of restoring justice and upholding the rule of law. So what is government responsibility? We see that the reg retribution and reparations to victims of violence. So who are the victims we're talking about? They are ostracized, impoverished due to nations, natural resources, being seized by the nation's dictator, oppressed, killed, forced to leave their houses, left out as refugees, raped in times of wars, and pillaged by soldiers. We see that those individuals are <coughs> historically, mentally, economically, and physically damaged, and we see that when it comes to simple lines of criminal offense, the victims, the presence of victims itself indicates that firstly government failed to protect them, and secondly there was a clear social harm that was inflicted within this period. So that's why restoration of justice must happen here. Because we see that the restoration of justice could only happen in the form of retribution coupled by the reparation following the rule of law. Why is this so? Firstly, government should do this because A, as the centers of the moral standards of the society, they should redress and empower minorities. Because they're culpable, also because they failed to protect those victims, and their negligence and inaction harmed them even more within that status of conflict. And B, we say that the government should oppose proportionality and retribution when it comes to people.
trusting and expecting the government to punish bad people and to reward good people instead of the border. Government not meeting up to that expectation itself is an immense failure. And secondly, the government is the only capable actor after doing this because we're talking about con post conflict society, which there's an asymmetry of power between the majority and the minority. We see that this power asymmetry could be only balanced out by government power when it comes to Rohingya Muslims and Myanmar, or when it comes to the ostracized minorities of the community. This cannot be done at an individual level because there's already a skewed distribution of resources because often people that are left on prosecuted are rich because they unjustly accumulate more economic and political resources and government intervention is only the way to balance this out and intervene and reset social order for a peaceful society to move on. So let's move on to the second argument. On a practical level, why are team garners long-term government stability? Before moving on, yes. When victors of a conflict deem an entire group of people as criminals, why will remunerations go to them on your side? We think that they operate under a premise that this legal enforcement itself, itself would be so distrustful and so unreliable. We think that that itself is killing both sides. We are under the premise that these legal enforcements would be reasonable. It would be under the constitution, the rule of law. We don't know why there's their debate under such a skewed premise. So we think that long-term government stability and benefit comes in three levels. First, we uphold the rule of law, which strengthens the legitimacy of the government. Usually in post conflict societies, there are still nascent when it comes to judicial structures during the process of concretizing the rule of law. We well, set the norm and the precedent of the government holding a clear line of justice, fostering faith in the legal system. Because if you see perpetrators just running away from any prosecution, this is still leads to an absolute loss of faith and trust in the government. So we now show how the law supersedes part of individuals and part of factions, which make the government more trustworthy under our world. Secondly, it leads to a more stable national identity in the long run. Because if those individuals go unprosecuted, they still feel the antagonism against them. We see that this happens in post conflict societies like Japan and South Korea, where prosecution did not properly take place. These seem to be divisive society because usually these same divisions and cleavage go yet unsolved when there weren't any legalistic measures to conclude them. They compete for their own agenda and narrative and congregating under a single goal of reconstruction and post conflict society building. Since, when, since their priority is not a collective uh, collective restoration, but rather their faction and their people just gaining more power and resources, we say that under our world is the only side which actually clearly goes through this healing process of executing the uh, executing perpetrators, redressing victims, setting the line of justice, and going on, moving on from the state of remorse and looking further because we have already done all the necessary job that a government, a responsible government, should do. And the third level of benefit is when it comes to the optimal distribution of resources. Because under their world, it's really likely that since if the legalistic procedures aren't met, there will be a lot of protests. There are going to be internal laws that fester into more conflicts, like police force and military force deployed to address social unrest. Under our world, we divert those resources in rebuilding critical infrastructure, welfare for the citizens, and setting necessary structures that the government ought to provide to the citizens. Under their world, they do nothing, they fester the problems that they're willing to solve. Through these reasons, we're extremely happy to oppose. I'd like to invite the second speaker of the team proposition to deliver this speech. No one in this debate is attempting to deny the existence of a conflict. What we are trying to say is that a healing process of, I quote first opposition, executions means that the conflict doesn't even end. I think it's important for us to recognize that it's true. We recognize everything that first opposition said, that governments do have a restorative duty to law and order. But insofar as they are unable to even prevent conflicts, they are only going to fester anger and hatred on their side of the house. When you execute, and I quote them, readers of factions that people think are important to them, that's when we cause even more problems. But I think to some degree, I'm not even sure whether or not they get the metrics of justice that they talk about. Because first opposition gives to us very compelling analysis as to why these countries are still trying to build legal precedent. But it's also added when Matthew gives you reasons as to why all the emotions and other such things rule over courts of law in these countries. 
And the reason it's not that it's important is because if they want to talk about justice, I'm not sure they're going to get proportionate justice in the manner in which they want to talk about. I'm going to ask two questions in this speech. First on justice and second on resolution. So first on justice. I'm going to continue crashing with this area in my second speaker argument. But before that, a few quick preliminary remarks. We recognize where side opposition is coming from, but we think that we need to recognize that justice isn't just about retribution. This is why, for example, when we punish people, we don't just say lash them, we put them in prison. The reason is because another purpose of justice is protecting society in the first place from these people. And I think to some degree, they recognize that this principle of retribution has its limits because people are, and they're not going to allow people, for example, to use angry mobs to hang, drop, drop, uh, sorry, to hang, draw, and quarter the majority of dictators that exist on their side. The fact that they're even bothering to go through the courts suggests to us that they recognize that this principle has limits as well. But I want us to do a very quick and simple way up here. I don't even think that dictators or faction leaders are likely to be part of the debate. And the reason is because, as Matthew gives you reasons, if you are a part of the conflict on their side, you're more likely to spend a lot of your time, say, running away from the country that you're likely to hang you. Because of this reason, they, for example, refuse to come back. This is what happened, for example, with Idi Amin, who spent the rest of his life hiding in Saudi Arabia. For this reason, I think the people that are prosecuting on their side of the house are faction leaders, but more like foot soldiers and people who might have even forced into the situation based on circumstance. And if they're going to throw these individuals into a court and it's not welcome to them, I think that's going to be significantly worse on their side of the house. So here's important here. I think they don't even get the multiple narratives that occur because they don't get a fair trial on their side of the house. If the nation, as they say, is healing, that means that emotions often run rampant in a courtroom. An incredibly adversarial prosecutorial system that literally decides the life and death of these individuals suggests to us that they are not even going to be able to get truth or justice at all. But if the dictator in question or a group in question holds sectarian power on their side, then that often means that they're going to, say, prosecute people who might even be innocent on their side. So I think it's just naive for them to assume that there are strong power structures in a post-conflict society. And on that basis alone, I don't think they even get their own, pr uh, they get their own principles of justice. No, thank you. So this brings me very nicely to my second question on resolution. And I think it's important for us to take note that this is the most important clash in this debate. Because recognize that if you want to talk about victims, I think the people who are literally dying in the conflict have a greatest, one of the greatest levels of burden and duty that we hold to these individuals. If they want to hold a government accountable, I think that's where we should stop it. The response that we got ending the war is they will use soft methods because they don't want to be prosecuted. But sometimes, often, some actions may not even be in the purview of these interests. So for example, if a warlord has subordinates to carry out actions, he knows that he is going to get punished for his actions, even if he himself hasn't committed such actions, and he knows that if he allows such a thing to happen, he himself is going to get prosecuted as well. This is when, for example, in battles of attrition, when groups are losing, for example, they're more likely out of desperation to act in terms of way worse impact. So for example, attempting to genocide entire populations to push for fear. Matthew gives few reasons as to why if you are losing a conflict, you become significantly more incentivized on our side at the point at which you know that you're not going to get punished to be able to actually end the conflict and push for a power sharing agreement. I think the only response is we won't trust them. I think the broader question here is that I think that there are many ways in which we can get these individuals to trust us in the first place. I think there are other ways, for example, for example, pushing our burdens or even things like ransoms or deposits. All of these things are other ways in which we can ensure that these individuals are trustworthy. But the final response here is that they fail to deal with Matthew's analysis about how we prevent the country from returning to a state of mess in the first place. For example, if multiple sectarian groups come to power, I'll take you in a second, the trial process that they're talking about can very well be used to eliminate dissent and opposition groups in these places. If the people in question are unhappy with the outcome of a trial, that often causes even more anger to occur, which often means a reintroduction of the very problems that they stated. Before that, please. Operating on your mechanism that these legal enforcements are not fair, how does your peace committee actually succeed in doing the job? Well, sir, the reason why it's more likely fair is because we're not placing value judgments on our side of the house. People are significantly more likely to take a less adversarial approach, more likely to present personal truth, and at least share what they personally feel on that conflict, which gives a more mouth, like, which gives a greater amount of plurality to the opinions that a conflict is likely to have. This moving very nicely onto my team's third and final argument. Here, I want to clash even 
greater with that case. I'm going to explain to you why we hold a sustainable future for the country in the long run. The thesis of this argument is a national narrative that is based on peace and reconciliation. It was what is best able to allow a nation to move on. And I'm not going to take opposition on their best part. I'm going to explain to you why we get even more of the sustainable narratives that we need. The first premise is that not prosecuting crimes allows nations to unite. Recognize that a narrative that says it's no one's fault means that it's a more unifying narrative. But I think it's important for us to recognize that it's not always true that people will remain to be angry if we don't punish dictators. Here's an, because often, politicians in post-conflict societies fuel the anger of politicians in order to keep themselves in power. So fueling the anger of the people allows me to say, look, I am the person who prosecuted the person that was or torturing all of you, that means that I should continue to stay in power for a systemically long period of time. And what this often means is that in post-conflict societies, vast groups of dictators or even people who come back into power are able to hold on to power based on a power grab or on the idea that they were the ones who prevented dictators from occurring in the first place. But here's what's crucial and here's what changes on our side. What changes is a truth and reconciliation committee gives a pluralistic understanding of the conflict. There are many groups in society and each one of them are able to have different understandings of the conflict. And this means there's a more unified national narrative that says, look, we had a conflict and it was really bad, but I think it's important that we move on and create a nation for ourselves to recognize that these things did happen, but it's significantly different. And only when hatred and anger is able to be moving on, that's when people are more likely to be able to make a more sustainable narrative. But I want to point out, it's not as if side proposition is able to stop this anger on their side of the house, because anger is incredibly limitless. A good example of this would be Gaddafi in Libya. People did take out the dictator, they did manage to kill him. But it does not necessarily mean that Libya currently lives in itself in a time of peace. In fact, quite the opposite, with multiple fighting states that exist on their side of the house. So to be clear, I'm not sure where the extent of their principle lies. They're going to have to continue finding each in every single person that harm these people or the people of a country that have wronged them. It's a side proposition, but we're a more sustainable change in democracy by understanding that purifying narratives are more important to people, to recognize that there are multiple truths to a conflict, but it's better that we move on and prevent the enclaving that might occur after a conflict. We believe that we cannot get a better future if we are stuck in the past. We're very proud to propose. that we will execute anyone that has ever caused a war crime. Or talk about things like Libya and Nigeria and assume us to explain why those conflicts won't be harmful on their, their side. We don't believe words would get them to win this debate. That's why I'm going to be clarifying two things before I move on to the world. First thing, their entire case hinges on the premise that oftentimes post-conflict societies will have a dictator that was in power before to have power again. Why is that not the debate we're having today? It's pretty clear, because the debate requires the premise that these governments are considering between providing amnesty or prosecuting these individuals that have been perpetrators in their war. That's why oftentimes, dictators that were oppressive, that responded to society in violence, do not have the incentive to have amnesty in the first place. That's why government's model is either very shallow and very limited in the cases of which that takes place, but rather is that they argue in a lot of things that aren't what the debate is. 
But secondly, when they argue that government judiciaries are not trustworthy and unstable, government opposition has given you so many layers of analysis as to why that's not true. First of all, he needs to explain why they are incentivized to be better because they need stability in a new democracy or a new society, and that's why they need to be fair in order to prevent coup d'etats. Especially, especially in considering why, conflicts are often between majorities with resources and minorities without, and therefore, to prevent a power vacuum, these places have to be very, very fair. And finally, why the ICC will always be in, involved and protecting these measures to be fair and clean in the first place. But even if that were to be true, even if what government is saying is true, we believe that over-punishing individuals will always be better than letting these individuals that are great individuals kill children, murder civilians, and bomb villages, pillage these areas, go free, scot free without any punishment. They do not defend our most principled argument as why government is justified to let individuals that have killed people, raped people, and burned villages to go scot free when that is absolutely horrid and nobody wants to support that. But further on, their budget wish is a peace committee. First of all, when we POI them, when peace committees work and when individuals be confessing about their crimes and why they did wrong, there is no narrative or there is no incentive or there is no analysis as to why that actually happens. But second of all, notice how the individuals we're considering here are victims of genocide, victims of rape, victims of violent shootings. This is why individuals in these peace committees that have been oppressed and have been criminalized and are victims of these warfare will not be agreeing to, oh, you're confessing to your crimes, I really sympathize with you, it's okay. Government has to bring such a model. So, two rebuttals, two main, uh, three main things I'm going to do in my rebuttals. Number one, talk about whether or not governments are justified and responsible to do what we're doing. Number two, what is the actual benefit that government brings to the table? Number three, respond to the third argument. So let's start with the first one. Yinzo clearly explains why it's principally the role of governments to neglect people that lose their lives, lose their families, lose their homes, and lose their dignities in this time of warfare and conflict. He explains why the government should represent these individuals, why they are the only people that can represent these individuals, and why they're the best people that can represent these individuals. Their only response to that principal argument as to why government should not neglect these individuals was that retribution has its limits and therefore you can't retribute everyone. The problem happens here is that government's comparative under that side is zero retribution. We're letting people that shoot bullets in children's heads go scot free, have amnesty, and live lives as normal. We believe that when they don't, don't be comparative and explain to them why it's justified for government to say, yeah, you can go free even if you do these many violent actions, they're never going to win this debate. Because even if they have all the benefits, when governments are actively supporting inhumane and horrid actions, we believe that should never be a team that's winning a team. If we should. Second point, benefits. They claim that their benefit or their goal will be long-term stability. But in essence, the only thing that their first finger brings is that they cause and they bring ceasefires earlier. We have three levels of response. Number one. A post-conflict society is where fights are fights have been over and a certain party is creating government on its own. That's why it's not the context in which there are rapid combats throughout the country that are playing in the world. That's a during conflict society, not a post-conflict society. That's why government can't conveniently use their context when it's not a post-conflict world. But second of all, avoiding prosecution. They talk about why because people are past the point of no return once they shoot a bullet, they will actively kill everyone in the community to, uh, to remove them from prosecution. Notice how prosecution is not executing all individuals. Notice how we explain from first on why courts will always be considering all the circumstances and give the proportional, the proportional punishment to individuals to the amount that they deceive them. That's why individuals are actively incentivized to do less when they know that prosecution will ultimately lead them on to doing more, uh, having more punishments when they do more crimes. That's why our world has people less having violence. But thirdly, even if we are, even if they are stopping conflicts to a certain extent, that also happens on our side. Because in post-conflict governments, we would actively try to stop guerrilla warfare in regions and outskirt regions and to try to solidify governments. You can't say that that doesn't happen on opposition side as well. That's why we need that one as well. The third argument, their basic third argument was very wordy, but it boils down to this: I prosecuted XXX, and therefore I should stay in power. Three levels of response. Number one, we believe it's extremely patronizing that they believe that people would think support people irrationally by saying that, oh, because that person was leading in this, prosecuting this person, I should definitely vote for that person forever, so that that person can vote for 30 years. We believe that that's actually ab absolutely irrational and patronizing. But number two, the whole point is that because when the government has to be fair under our model and the government has to be credible, that's exactly why these individuals cannot read such narratives. But number three, even if that were to be the case, 
case, we believe it's still better if people believe that that person represents them. In the case where they don't support a government that would close a blind eye, turn a blind eye on these abhor, uh, abhorrent human, uh, human rights violations, we believe if they support an individual that actively prosecuted the criminals of that, we believe that's a justified choice. Now, moving on to my argument. My argument talks about why opposition is the one that uniquely brings economic flourishment and why government encloses these communities in rich poor gaps. Communities that are going through conflicts often have wealth congregating on the top, entrapping inside social networks, or in corruption, meaning that the government does not have a stable tax revenue, and that infrastructure, the welfare, cannot sustain all economic classes. That's why when you grant amnesty to these perpetrators, the world on government ends up looking like political, social, and economic capital still consolidating around people that unfairly obtained their upper class status during the war. This means it often ends up in a power vacuum, as things were already explained, why people can overturn the government because the government doesn't have legitimacy and power. However, even when we take government's best case, assuming but not conceding that they will get stability under their world, they end up stabilizing an economic gap between the rich and the poor. For instance, that looks like the formation of favelas in post conflict Brazil, or pro Japanese people dominating businesses in Korea when the families of the people that sacrificed their lives for the country are stuck in poverty. When government legitimizes the gap by letting them keep that wealth, which was unfair to begin with, it's illegal and it's therefore it's unable for us to regulate that in the future because even when we even after society has progressed, it's more harmful and more impractical for us to say that you should give your wealth back because that was unfair. That's why opposition's comparative is that the government will always outline a policy on rebuilding our societies, rebuilding our communities based on the wealth that we take away from these individuals, the unique benefit that government can never take away. They need to justify why governments can and should turn a blind eye to the victims of horrid war crimes, unless they explain that they're not going to win this game. Thank you.